So welcome uh, uh, everybody and uh, thank you for uh, joining us for uh, the second event of the series uh, Memory and Trauma Through History and Culture at uh, Simon Fraser University. Uh, the first event was uh, the two-day symposium on migrations, so while today's uh, panel is on the theme of uh, pandemics. This event is being hosted by the Department of Humanities and Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies with the sponsorship from the Institute of Humanities at Simon Fraser University. The event's organizers include the scholars of the Department of Humanities at SFU, Irene Kotsovili, James Horncastle, and myself, Alessandra Caperdoni. Before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that all three entities are responsible for this event at Simon Fraser University and they are located on Burnaby Mountain on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Seilavatuth, Maskiam and Quiquitlam people. Pandemics have been a recurrent phenomena in history and Yet the sense of newness that we think we are experiencing, fed by historical and social amnesia, as well as the world of media, may in fact be due to the disavowal we experience in the face of the detrimental role that human action has played in the age of late modernity. In putting together this panel, Irene, James and myself were interested in bringing together different perspectives on pandemics. What can we learn from human responses throughout history and across nations? What insights do the humanities provide on pandemics in relation to human and non-human ecologies? The ravages of capital, the reproduction of societal clefts and hierarchies, or the sacrifice of the vulnerable ones? Pandemics invite almost naturally the intervention of a scientific knowledge and the action of effective governance. But pandemics are as much as a question of the, the real as a question of the symbolic role, that is of language and discourse and therefore of the vulnerabilities that each society produces. How then can the humanities intervene in such discourse? Before we move on to our keynote, to our um, uh, series of presentations, I would like to um, remind everyone that this webinar is uh, being recorded. So if you have any questions or concerns about uh, Zoom's uh, privacy at SFU security guidelines, uh, you can visit the SFU IT services website. Uh, at the conclusion of uh, uh, the um, panel, we will host a Q&A session. So all the discussion will take place at the very end of the presentations. We thought that in being this one panel, it would be a better idea to uh, pull a different uh, um, people together and uh, uh, cross-pollinating perspectives between the different areas of expertise. We have uh, four speakers uh, listed uh, for our panel today. Uh, unfortunately, Said Abbas has uh, had to withdraw due to illness, not to COVID, fortunately. Um, I will introduce them individually before each paper, and we will reserve, as I just said, all the questions at the very end. And uh, um, I'm uh, now pleased to introduce uh, um, our first uh, uh, speaker. Diana Reeder is a Cree Associate Professor in the Department of Indigenous Studies and the Department of English at Simon Fraser University, where she teaches courses in Indigenous popular fiction and Canadian Indigenous literatures, especially autobiography. She is the current chair of Indigenous Studies and the past director of the MATE program, the Masters of Art for Teachers in English. She is the principal investigator in partnership with the co-applicants Dr. Marjorie Fee and Cherokee scholar Dr. Daniel Heath Justice of the University of British Columbia, 
on a five-year shirk from the project called The People and the Text, Indigenous Writing in Northern North America up to 1992. And she has a very long list of uh, prolific uh, activities and publications that I'm not going uh, to list uh, here since they're available on their website. Um, I would immediately like uh, to introduce uh, Diana and uh, the title of uh, her paper is uh, Pandemics in the So-Called New World. So over to you, Diana. Thanks so much, Alexandra, and thank you. I had gotten into the Google Doc and erased some of that list, so I'm really glad you uh, um, made that good decision. Um, welcome, everyone. I am looking forward to the, the oncoming conversation. When um, again, um, just to follow local protocols, uh, I want to point out that even though my um, my family um, comes from the prairies, from all around, uh, um, but specifically my Nehiao Napita Kustan family, my Kriya Metis family are come from Northern Saskatchewan. Um, um, however, I've had the great fortune for almost 30 years to live and raise my children on the um, unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh and Coquitlam peoples, as well as Stalo peoples actually out in the valley. I am a literary critic and so I, when I first thought about this topic of pandemics, um, I, I, I wasn't exactly sure what, we're gonna, what was going to happen and I've been, um, of course, in a presentation, been pulling together some different conversations that have been making me think, only to go into uh, my archive um, uh, for uh, Cree writer Joseph Dion who I'll tell you a bit about in the paper, and to find a narrative that he wrote down um, uh, about uh, um, the effects of smallpox on the life of a small boy. So I I'm, um, didn't realize and wouldn't have looked for that if um, it hadn't been for this opportunity. So let me, let me get going. The title of Jared Diamond's 1997 book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, makes clear that he argues um, that the advantages leading to successful conquests um, by erasure of much of the world would be you know, guns, germs, and steel. However, uh, while Charles Mann, who is the author of uh, 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus, does not explicitly contest Diamond's thesis, he does provide alternative perspectives. Man takes issue with the idea that Europe was technologically superior, you know, that conquest was based on guns and steel. And man emphasizes the technological sophistication of indigenous peoples of the Americas, along with the fact that the average Native American in 1491, you know, as compared with the pauper in England, let's say, during the same time period, you know, had a higher quality of life, a, a better diet, better housing. Um, and it's man who quotes from colonist William Wood um, at the time of uh, uh, the um, early contact, that the Donland Wetu, or the, the housing of people in uh, Indigenous New England, um, with its, quote, multiple layers of mats, which trapped insulating layers of air, were warmer than our English houses. So Wood's re Wood reports. He explains that Wetu's, quote, deny entrance to any drop of rain, though it come fierce and long. And likewise, man makes the point that a 17th century gun had fewer advantages over a longbow that might be supposed, that steel was less valuable in Indian cultures, for example, than plasticity might be. All of this is just to say that contemporary research suggests that you know, indigenous peoples in, in New England and the Americas more largely are, are, were not technically inferior to, um, or technologically inferior to um, the British or to Europe, let's say and maybe that the terms superior and inferior do not readily apply. But if there is a point on which both Diamond and Charles Mann agree, it is that germs, you know, that caused pandemics and full-scale loss of life were devastating to the Americas. And so uh, Charles Mann in his fourth chapter of 1491 actually lays out the, the discussion between so-called high counters and low counters. And those would be historians and anthropologists who propose the pre-Columbian population numbers using a variety of techniques. And the thing that, that both camps agree on, whether um, how many millions were proposed to have lived in the Americas, um, 
you know, before contact or not. Um, but what they, what they do agree with, though, is that Indigenous North America was not originally as empty as it was, appeared to be um, by the uh, by the 17th century. And Mann gives the example, um, or, uh, or as a reason for this, by discussing Hernando de Soto, who in 1539 landed in Florida from Spain. He'd already had a life of wreckage uh, in, in Peru. And for four years, uh, de Soto's uh, force of over 600 soldiers, 200 horses, and 300 pigs wandered around uh, what's now called Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, you know, and they were looking for gold and wrecking almost, this is his quote, actually wrecking most everything um, that touched. Um, but what is notable is that some of his soldiers accounted for, quote, a land thickly set with great towns, two or three of them to be seen from one. Each of these cities had earthen walls, moats, and large populations. By 1542, so about three years after De Soto arrived, he died of a fever on the banks of the Mississippi, and half of his men died, and almost all of his horses as well. But a century later, so from 1542 up, up to 1682, so 140 years later, French colonizers led by La Salle arrived to these lands and they found the ter territory to be deserted. Where De Soto found cities cheek by jowl, the French did not see a village for 200 miles. And according to archeologist Anne Ramanofsky and anthropologist Patricia Galloway, the source of the contagion was likely the pigs and the results were devastating. Uh, Timothy Pritula, an archaeologist, commented on just one site visited by De Soda and later La Salle, estimating that the population, which was at that time known for erecting public plazas and ceremonial platforms, uh, you know, all in an urban landscape, you know, dropped from 200,000 to 8,500. And then a century later, in the 1700s, that number dropped to 1,400. So the effect of contact was devastating. Um, anthropologist Russell Thornton argues that that's one reason that um, settlers th thought of Indians, this is quote, Indians as nomadic hunters. Everything else, all the heavily populated urbanized societies was wiped out. You know, pandemics then tore through the Americas, you know, using pre-existing indigenous trade routes some of them preceding, um, preceding contact. We know that to be true, actually, in British Columbia. All of this contributes to the idea the legal, the, of terra nullius, you know, a legal concept that land is uninhabited and empty. You know, the idea of terra nullius was part of the allure for settlement. You know, um, people left Europe in droves to come for free land for the taking. And this um, this, the, the effects of this pandemic also contributed to what Mann calls Holmberg's mistake. And in, in this term, he talks about a young anthropologist named Holmberg, who wrote an account of the culture of the Siriono, and this would be the indigenous peoples of Brazil. This book called, was called Nomads of the Longbow, which was published in 1950. And Mann recounts um, Holmberg's bleak evaluation, you know, that the Syrian were culturally backward, they were impoverished, they were living in constant want and hunger, they lacked clothes, domestic animals, musical instruments, complex math, adequate shelter. And Mann states that even though, quote, at some risk to himself, as Holmberg tried to help the Syrian, he never fully grasped that the people he saw as remnants from the Paleolithic age were actually persecuted survivors of a recently shattered culture. It was as if he had come across refugees from a Nazi concentration camp and concluded that they belonged to a culture that had always been barefoot and starving. I think about that 
uh, um, blindness or Holmberg's mistake, if you like, when I think about a point made by historian Jill Lepore, and this is in the documentary After the Mayflower, as part of the PBS series, We Shall Remain, particularly useful if you're um, thinking about American Thanksgiving, I, um, after it tells the story of early contact um, in New England. And, and makes the point that in 1617 to 1619, there was an epidemic that swept through New England you know, just prior to, to May, the arrival of the Mayflower. And unlike a, a, a normal epidemic where a few people get sick and then recover to take care of others who were sick, um, instead, everybody got sick at the same time with horrifying amounts of death. They, they, it was called that the time was turned upside down. So I'm quoting Lepore when she says, quote, a whole village might have two survivors. And those two survivors were not just like any two people. They were two people who had seen everyone they know die miserable, wretched, painful, excruciatingly painful deaths. So it's not only the population that was eviscerated, it's that the survivors were deeply affected by their experiences and vulnerable in, a, in ways that are hard to imagine, a sort of post-apocalyptic vulnerability. She then goes on to talk, and other historians who contribute to this documentary, um, about Massasoit, who was the leader of the Wampanoag, that he had seen you know, nine of 10 people um, in his village, China, nine out of every 10 people of his village perish. You know, it, it, you know, he lived through a season of death and um, at the time of the first Thanksgiving was trying to navigate uh, past that. Yet, in the discussion of pandemics, it's often related um, to the damage made at contact, if it's remembered at all. What I want to share with you is the work of Joseph Dion. Uh, Joseph Dion is a Cree intellectual, a descendant of Big Bear a teacher who was born in 1888 and passed away in, in 1960. Joseph Dion was a status Cree member of Kaywin Indian Band, and that would be called Kaywin First Nation. And even in the 1930s, he was horrified by the poverty of his Métis relatives. And so he joined forces with Métis activists, James Brady, Malcolm Norris, Felix Calico, Peter Tompkins. These are known in Albertan history or Canadian history as the famous five who successfully agitated for Métis rights, um, specifically in Alberta, though certainly some of them were, tried to work more nationally. But Dion was also a writer. Um, as Alessandra mentioned, uh, my research focuses on the neglected archive of Indigenous authors who wrote often and uh, tried to get published. It's often said that uh, Indigenous um, literary production is oral in nature. And in fact, um, my strong assertion is that there's a strong um, body of written, written work um, in the English language that had a very difficult time finding publication. And so Dion's work, My Tribe, the Crees, is a manuscript that he had completed um, all throughout the 40s and 50s. Um, but uh, it wasn't he when he passed in 1960, and it wasn't released until 1979, um, when Hugh Dempsey um, edited it and and provided it forward, um, working through the Glenbow Museum in Calgary. But because of my interest in Dion, I was able to look at some of the Dion papers that I found at the Glenbow, and noted that Dion was very concerned with. Uh, collecting stories of people that were just a little bit older than him. So he was born in 1988 and he found, I, I want to share with you the reminiscences of Antoine Gibault, who was uh, um, the, the interview or the re reminiscences dated about 1870 when um, the, uh, the narrator was eight years old. So he would have been about two decades younger than, a bit, I mean, about the younger than um, Dion. And Antoine Chabot um, discusses a smallpox epidemic that affected his family. Uh, and if you look at the um, historical record, there was a, a, a huge smallpox epidemic in the West, especially in Alberta in 1870. So it uh, cross references that way. And the narrator is someone like Massasoit who, who had seen 
his family parish. He quote, quote, I was only eight years old at the time of the smallpox, yet I remember certain incidences, incidents as if they took place but yesterday. And it's a bleak account. Quote, my first recollection of the epidemic was that of my oldest brother being sick. Also, a sister younger than myself. These two died in the night. My father followed soon afterward. And I watched my mother place the bodies of my brother and sister in the cellar. She then fixed up a place in one corner of the house and we laid my father's body there. And if this isn't harrowing enough, uh, they then leave their home, quote, that done, my mother took us out to the edge of the woods where she said we would have to camp as it wouldn't do for us to stay in the house any longer. There was only a portion of our tent or teepee left as part of it had been used to wrap our dead in. So the best we could do was set a few poles and stretch the remainder of the tent to form a shelter from the north wind. And we then made a fire on the south side. All of this wasn't done so easily. Mother was already sick. My baby brother cried all the time and my older other brother was not very strong either. I was the only one not sick. Anyhow, we finally made camp and each having eaten what we could of some white fish and potatoes, we all went to bed and just before I fell asleep, I heard my mother express the fear that she would not see another day. What will happen to my little children, she said. And that was the last time I ever heard my mother speak. My brother woke me sometime during the night and said, mother is gone, we will have to move. We took what few things we could to cover with and went to the middle of the garden. We again made a rough kind of bed where to spend the rest of the night. And I noticed that the baby's voice was now very weak. My brother sent me back after some first, uh, um, um, after some things from our ca last camp and I ran back. Uh, picking up a stick that was still burning good. I took it back along with some dry wood and we managed to start a little blaze. I went back for all the dry sticks I could find and placing them where my brother could get at easily, I crawled back to bed. Just before daylight, I again awakened to be told that the baby was dead and that my brother was cold. He had burned up all our wood and the fire was almost out. This is all, of course, very harrowing and in the context of uh, um, in the, uh, the sort of, um, buffalo failing and so food sources failing and the coming encroachment, of course, three days after the official um, Confederation of Canada uh, in 1867, although Alberta didn't officially join in until 1905. And Jubo reflects about how little they had with them. You know, it's easy to relate to his simple statement that he says, however I pulled through is more than I can tell. And the narrative continues on and there are more hardships, you know, in, including an, a fire uncontrolled and until it's the middle of the next night. I managed to keep a little fire going until I got sleepy when I crawled in beside my brother. I don't know how long I slept. When I awoke, it was cold. And when I got closer to my brother, he was cold as ice. He had died during the night. I was now left all alone. And for the first time I cried. And in the manuscript, in a different pen, Dion writes a short note that is our only conclusion. Uh, quote, falls back to sleep when he dreams about his grandfather. We have no idea about, at least I haven't found yet in the archive, any additional notes about this story. Um, we don't, you know, we can easily imagine him uh, not able to proceed at the conversation or simply Dion um, stopping and ending. We don't know how this eight-year-old boy got from at the, this point of tears and then a dream to being uh, able to then survive and, and end up being a, an old man telling the story. Um, but we do know that Dion had a sympathy and a desire to save this. And so I think about uh, the relation of this kind of, uh, you know, ongoing um, sort of epidemics uh, and disease. And I, and I think about Dion 
and his own biography. So Dion, of course, born in 88, 1888, um, had two siblings um, who survived, but he also had four others who passed away from diphtheria. Uh, he did go to residential school and he was a good student. He, was, he, he loved, to, um, loved to study and in fact became a teacher himself. Um, and he had happy memories of, of time at school, except for the persistence of illness and death among his classmates primarily from tuberculosis. All of this thinking about my you know, knowledge of Indigenous history in Canada and the ongoing uh, um, vulnerabilities because of poverty, because of medical neglect, because of lack of infrastructure, uh, um, but the vulnerabilities to ongoing and persistent disease long after it's thought of as being relevant to Canadian society. What's particularly galling though is that Dion uh, it, it was mindful his whole life of presenting a, a positive image to the public of Indigenous people um, in order to promote, you know, good relations. And, and in fact, he, he managed a, a Métis dance troupe in the 19, 1930s specifically to dispel sort of neg negative stereotype. And just thinking about the, um, those gaps in understanding of Indigenous realities of pandemics, you know, thinking about the Massasoit, for example, um, that we don't often think about the trauma that they, sur that they survived in, in order to, you know, uh, negotiate, you know, the, the realities of their own lives. You know, we have Dion also negotiating a lot of um, loss of life, and yet, and as well as trying to battle, present, you know, the, the image of the good Indian, if you like. All of this, just making, trying to make connections to writing today, because I think about the fascination, um, actually, of Indigenous horror uh, uh, um, by, by a new generation of filmmakers, but also with Indigenous futurisms. I think about Métis um, author Shuri Jemeline's uh, The Marrow Thieves, or Anishinaabe scholar Grace Dillon's uh, um, Walking the Clouds. That's an anthology of Indigenous um, speculative fiction. And some of this um, is a focus on the future because it's a direct re rejection of the engagement with the stereotype of the past, you know, the cowboy and Indians or the American fantasy of itself. And some of it is a rejection of the colonial present. But some of it's also the recognition that for Indigenous people in our hemisphere, we, we know the accompanying terror of the apocalypse because Indigenous people have experienced it already for over half a millennia. And even as our people are vulnerable because of this history, you know, to today's pandemics. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Diana, for this uh, harrowing uh, account of, uh, of trauma survival, as you describe it very, very well. It is interesting to go back to the archive and find these unrepresented voices that uh, really change uh, our, our position and raise the constant questions about whose voices are being preserved and heard and whose voices are, are not, are silenced through different uh, machinic uh, apparatus. Um, I'm going to, as I said before, we're going to have uh, questions uh, and the discussion at the very end. In the meantime, if you have a question, you can post that in the question and answer period so that uh, um, uh, Lauren will be able to uh, gather them uh, together. And uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, I want to thank again uh, uh, Diana Reader and uh, uh, move to the second speaker, Andreas Avgusti, um, who um, uh, Andreas Avgusti is associated with uh, the Stavros and Yarkos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University. Um, he received uh, his uh, PhD in political uh, science at Columbia uh, University. He has been a visiting assistant professor at different uh, posts uh, and he is uh, currently working uh, in, uh, uh, on a manuscript uh, entitled uh, Recovering Reputation, Plato and Demotic Power for Oxford University. 
as well as a second uh, book length project tentatively entitled The Democratic Good from Late Antiquity Persuasion in John Chrysostom. And uh, the paper of Andreas Augusti is uh, entitled Anarchic, Leaderless, and Boundless on the Democratic Characteristics of the Virus. So I invite now Andreas to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. And thank you to Irini and to Jamie uh, for inviting me. And thank you, of course, to Lauren for your backstage work. Um, as, you, as you just heard, I'm a political theorist and uh, I specialize in ancient political thought. So you're going to hear some Thucydides from me, you're going to hear some Plato, uh, and you're also going to hear uh, about a little red figure uh, from the uh, 20th century called Elias Canetti. As the uh, title of the talk indicates, uh, Anarchic, Leaderless and Boundless, on the democratic characteristics of the virus. This is a deliberately provocative title and I intend it in a playful uh, spirit in, this, in the sense of which Nietzsche spoke of the Greeks as having a, a playful spirit. And I think it's appropriate uh, because I'm talking about the Greeks to, to, to offer it in that way. So let's, let's begin in medias res. In book eight of Plato's Republic, we find a famous account of regime change. From the most just and happiest city ruled by philosophers, we fall lower and lower in the scale of regimes until we arrive at tyranny, the unhappiest regime full of injustice. In this account, Plato offers a psychological explanation for the desire for power. The man who becomes a tyrant has a soul, psyche, ruled by erotic desire, eros. Two processes are at work. First, the tyrant emerges as the people's champion. Democracy precedes and generates tyranny. Second, he is transformed from a leader of the people, a Vimagoros, into a tyrant. This second process involves spilling, quote, kindred citizen blood, as he brings fellow citizens to court where they are condemned to death. To become a tyrant is to, quote, be transformed from a man into a wolf, an animal of prey. To psychologize politics, that is to explain political behavior by relying upon psychological character, categories such as eros to do so, I claim, can slip into pathologizing politics. Pathological accounts describe groups of people using terms like health and sickness, as did the leader of the Greek junta, Georgios Papadopoulos, upon seizing power in April 1967, when he collectively described his fellow citizens as a patient needing surgery, followed by recovery in a cast. The objections to such accounts are well known. They minimize the importance of structural inequalities endemic in the institutions and procedures by which a people rules itself, direct attention away from material deprivation and the distribution of resources, which result in disproportionate suffering by some portions of the population, and distract from the general need of people central to political life to be seen by their fellows. Here, I'd like to re rehearse another objection. Pathological accounts can empower experts over and above the many, as Papadopoulos's surgeon metaphor suggests. You might have guessed why I bring this up now. Pathological explanations of politics are tempting once again in the time of the SARS-CoV-2 virus pandemic and the disease it causes, COVID-19. Liberal democracies have turned to public health experts, folks who know more than most about how to prevent, stimmy, and recover from an outbreak. It is tempting to speak of public health and of its pathologies if we are to protect the population and vulnerable subsections of it. It is well known that the pandemic affects the disadvantaged and the unseen disproportionately, and I worry that the turn to public health experts will dull democratic behaviors. We no longer need the testimony of the historian Thucydides of the sickness or disease, Knossos, which struck Athens in the second year of the Peloponnesian War between that city and Sparta 
to establish that people behave differently in pandemics. The historian avoids a pathological account of the disease, which decimated, as the best estimate tell us, about a third of the population of Attica. Thucydides moves from a matter-of-fact description of the ravages it brought to those who contracted it to a detached sociological observation of what happened and what people said. Yet his account can still surprise. From the physiologically vivid, the feverish sufferers who could not bear contact with any clothing, to the morally repulsive, people sacrilegiously taking advantage of existing funeral pyres to dispose of their dead, to the familiar, the absence from discourse of the usual complaints, or if people made them, they turned out to be about the disease. The form the plague took defied all reason, yenomenon rar crison logu toidos disnisu, Thucydides judges. What is missing from his account is a democratic flavor. We hear nothing of the institutional measures the Athenian demos took. This does not make the historian's account neutral with respect to democracy, for there is implied in it a critique of the regime. Thucydides tells us that pleasure became the order of the day, for no one knew when they would die. Here is the old anti-democratic charge. More than any other regime, democracies sanction pleasure seeking. Because the democracy valued pleasure above all, it is a regime which affords and guarantees pleasures to the demos. When the disease struck, lawlessness broke loose. The epidemic defied all reason, defied all logos, because logos, reason, was already on its last legs. Put otherwise, the lawlessness of the cities describes is very much an accusation against democracy as anarchy, a Greek word which uses the prefix to negate arche, rule. Anarchy means no rule. The charge that democracy is an anarchic regime is the very same we find in Plato's Republic, this time without the epidemic. Whether this is in Plato's, in favor of Plato's account or not, I'll leave, you, I'll leave it up to you to decide. He jokes that in a democracy, anarchy extends beyond social and private relationships to animals. Quote from Plato's Republic, horses and donkeys are accustomed to roam freely and proudly along the streets, bumping into anyone who doesn't get out of their way. End of quote. As Democrats, we should embrace this charge. In a democracy, no one rules because the distinction between rulers and ruled cannot apply. This follows from the principle of equality, democracy being the only regime where nothing can violate that principle, neither age nor wealth, neither merit nor nobility, neither strength nor knowledge. As Jacques Rancière puts it, quote, democracy is the capacity of anybody at all to judge the relations between individuals and the collectivity, present and future. The sudden prominence of public health officials and other experts is uniquely poised to help us appreciate the characterization of democracy as the capacity of anybody at all to judge. For we have witnessed opinion frustrate experts. Democracy runs on opinion as the Athenians realized long ago. And this is as it should be from a philosophical point of view. For to say that experts have been frustrated by opinion is to raise the old problem of the impossibility of inferring an imperative from an indicative. Whatever the scientific evidence tells us, it can only indicate what will happen. I need not go into examples. History furnishes us with a plenitude of horrors when a scientific indicative was mistaken for a political imperative. Indeed, the following the scientific evidence is a judgment the politician has to justify to her constituents, for it is not the scientist whom we hold to account in a democracy, but the elected leaders. And if our elected leaders are themselves scientists, as is the case with German Chancellor Angela Merkel, then it is their performance in office, not their expertise, that we hold to account. If an elected official follows the science just because it's the science, that is, from blind faith in her own public health experts, she's not doing her job. Similarly, if an elected official follows the science after proper consideration, should the science prove to be wrong in some way, consider the lack of sufficient evidence until well into July 2020 
regarding the effectiveness of cloth masks, then it is her whom we will hold to account, not the experts she consulted. The claim that democracy is anarchic is a starting point we can use to get past Plato's psychological explanation for political behavior and its pathological temptations. The demos who rule are leaderless. They are an anarchic crowd. In the work of Elias Canetti titled Crowds and Power, the German is Masse und Macht, first published in 1960, the essential characteristic of a crowd is that it is leaderless. This is not to say that crowds are not led or that leaders have not appeared to lead this or that crowd, but that crowds cannot create leaders. For Canetti, the crowd is where human beings overcome the fear of the touch of the unknown. To bring this to mind, recall the last time you woke up in the dark and accidentally bumped into something. The crowd, in fact, is where this fear turns into its opposite, into an elation of being with and being touched by unknown others. People join crowds, and here I should say that Canetti's crowds are legion, he never speaks of the crowd. People join crowds to offload what he calls the burdens of distance. The burdens of distance refer to the separations created by rank, property, wealth, merit, and knowledge. Under these burdens, there is a loss of freedom of movement a forgetfulness that they are self-inflicted, and a feeling of impossibility that one should free oneself. By contrast, in the crowd, quote, the individual feels that he is transcending the limits of his own person. With the lifting of the burdens of distance, he feels free, end of quote. To be in a crowd is to be free. To have the burdens of distance lifted is to be equal to everyone else. Recall the animals in the democracy Plato described. They are free, bumping into this person and that, roaming wherever they like, asserting an equality with human beings. Freedom and equality are co-principal characteristics of Plato's democracy, a feature implied already in the description of the regime as anarchic. If you're unfamiliar with Canetti, I hazard that some of what you just heard sounds bizarre. Allow me then to be explicit about his phenomenological approach. Phenomenology is a tricky term laden with normative assumptions. I understand by it the description of phenomena from the first person perspective of the one experiencing them. A phenomenologist like Canetti sees himself as a radical questioner of dogma, traditional and scientific, as someone who directs his attention to things as they are in themselves to reinstate what is often lost in reified academic philosophical discourse, namely a living contact with reality. Canetti's self-consciously anti-psychological and phenomenological account promises to escape the pathological temptation. Following Thucydides' account of the epidemic, Canetti writes that, quote, all ordinary relationships are abrogated. Each man shuns every other. His last hope is to keep his distance. End of quote. Social distancing is, as Canetti helps us see, an oxymoronic pleonasm. Either one is distant and not being social, or one is being social and therefore not distant. Quote, the prospect of life and life itself is expressed in terms of distance from the sick. The hope of, sur of survival isolates them, each becoming a single individual confronting the crowd of victims. End of quote. Canetti writes that in an, in an epidemic, people see the advance of death. It takes place under their very eyes. How do, how do we see this advance today? We see numbers on screen. 1.35 million dead worldwide, a quarter of a million of which are from the United States, and north of 11,000 from Canada. We who have thus far survived are alive to read the numbers. What is the felt experience of these numbers? We may be indifferent to them, or we might feel grief. Yet Canetti can help us see that something else is also at work here. His insight is that survival is a feeling of power. Survival or self-preservation, the escaping of death, is the sign of the powerful. If we revisit Plato's account of the tyrant, we see the outsized role death plays in it. 
the tyrant becomes a parasite, killing the demons who fathered him. It is this felt impulse to survive and to increase, adding to the numbers of the invisible dead, both within the city he rules and outside, outside of it as he pursues foreign wars, which explains the tyrant's actions. He stands tall, surviving them all. Absent a vaccine, this power is felt more strongly and was on full display on October 5th, 2020, when President Donald Trump contracted and overcame the disease, standing proudly at the White House upon returning from hospital and removing his mask in a theatrical gesture of defiance of the public health experts. Isn't this a moment of felt power? The feeling of the survivor? Thucydides has a wonderful remark about those who contracted the disease and recovered. Quote, in the exhilaration of the moment, these people entertained the hope that at no time in the future would they be killed by any other disease." End of quote. Death, as anyone who is over 65 or so in the global north will tell you, is a massacre. Family, lifelong friends, and acquaintances start disappearing one by one without end. The pandemic draws the attention of everyone to what Canetti calls the crowd of the dead, who are, quote, an essential part of life itself. The crowd of the dead is best understood as a double crowd in continuous antagonism with the crowd of the living. And those of you familiar with the Game of Thrones story, where those who die become part of the army of the dead who return to fight the living already understand what I'm about to say. In this antagonism, one side is always larger in number than the other, and members of the living will always join the dead. It is as if the dead, being stronger and more numerous, drag the living over to them. Writes Canetti, the essence of this fight between the living and the dead is that it is an intermittent one. One can never know when something is going to happen. In the situation of a pandemic, therefore, where our political injustices are not leveled, but magnified, the equality of which we can speak is, in Kennedy's words, an equality of terrible expectation. Plato argues that it is the erotic madness which seizes the tyrant which accounts for his doings. And Kennedy would indeed agree that the pursuit of power is a sign of madness. But what is off-putting about Plato's account of the most unjust and most wretched man is that it does in fact pathologize the tyrant. He turns out to be an addict who cannot control himself, his soul being, quote, full of fear, convulsions, and pain, end of quote, much like the city he, he rules. The psychological account in this case ends up robbing the tyrant and the city of agency. It tempts those who come upon a tyrant and his population to treat him and them as lacking agency. Again, I don't think I need to list historical and indeed current examples of precisely this kind of treatment by empires and democracies. Canetti then helps us arrive at another objection to psychological explanations of politics, which veer into pathological accounts. Much like the crowd theory of Gustave Le Bon, to which Canetti is objecting, these tempt us to render collective actors as passive, sick patients, like Papadopoulos' description of the Greek people in April 1967. Canetti does follow Plato in one crucial respect. Any account of the many must be accompanied by an account of power. If we adopt this commitment, two lessons might be drawn from the pandemic. First, that we ought to resist on normative democratic grounds, explanations which conceptualize the many as passive and or manipulable. And second, that the dead have an impact on the demos which is not mere indifference or entirely grief laden. It is also a felt impact of survival and of the empowerment which follows from it. Such an empowering, if it is to manifest in a democratic or anarchic sense, has to do so in a crowd. The anarchic character of democracy is aligned with the view of the SARS-CoV-2 virus as a crowd of particles, virions is the technical term, with no leader, spreading unpredictably. It demonstrates another fundamental characteristic of crowds, 
increase. For Canetti, the crowd always wants to grow, there being no natural boundaries to its growth. Such crowds are by definition transgressive, blind to the boundaries of property and border alike, and above all, leaderless, much like SARS-CoV-2. In their behaving as such, they corroborate Thucydides' description of the Athenians, quote, regarding their lives and their property as equally ephemeral, whatever gave immediate pleasure or in any way facilitated it became the standard of what was good and useful, end of quote. The charge that democracy is a regime of pleasure, a regime in which folks live on, yielding day by day to their desire at hand, as Plato's Republic puts it, suggests a blind spot so far unnoticed. To privilege pleasure is to look away from the dead, that is, away from those who cannot pursue or experience it. In sum, SARS-CoV-2 teaches us that the democratic experience of the crowd is what is at stake during the death-dealing pandemic. This is not to say that public health advice should be ignored, but instead a reminder that a crucial democratic experience is in jeopardy when lockdowns, curfews, and restrictions of movement are in force. My hope is that when the virus is no longer a threat to us who are alive, our democratic sensibilities will not have been dulled, that we will not be drunk with the powerful feeling of having survived, of winning another battle against the invisible crowd of the dead, that we can remember the lesson of that anarchic, boundless, and leaderless crowd of virions. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Andreas, for a very rich uh, paper and uh, on a personal note also for taking us back to Canetti's uh, um, uh, Massum Macht that uh, um, I recall uh, from a very long ago. I should really go back reading it with all of these uh, connections to epidemics uh, were, were really out of my, um, my remembrance. Uh, so um, we're going to hold off for the discussion period at the very end of all the presentations. In the meantime, people have already started. We have already uh, one question for Diane um, in the question and answer uh, thread. We're going to take a 10 minutes break uh, and uh, we'll be back uh, uh, on time at 3.33. Thank you very much. Excellent. So it's already 3.34, so I uh, will just start and not to lose any more time. So the sooner we get to the discussion period, uh, the better. I'm introducing now uh, Sergio Basso, uh, who is uh, this year's uh, Hellenisms, past and present, uh, local and global postdoctoral fellow at the Stavros and Yorkos Foundation for Hellenic Studies. Over the past 15 years, Sergio has worked in communication projects, cross-media platforms, radio programs, and documentaries. He is a researcher of Byzantine studies in Italy, and is also associated with researchers in different areas spanning religious studies and multiculturalism, race, and ethnicity. Um, he has uh, uh, recently produced a very interesting uh, um, work, uh, Sarita, a musical uh, written and directed by him, uh, which uh, recently premiered at the Vancouver International Film Festival, um, and which uh, shares the odyssey of a 13-year-old refugee and uh, her family forced uh, to overcome uh, government suppression, displacement, and the silent international community in their pursuit to find a better future. Uh, Sergio Vasso's uh, paper for uh, today is uh, titled Pandemic, the body as illness in asceticism. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you. Thank the organizers for uh, this very kind invitation. Please confirm that you both see me and, the, and my screen, the slides. Yes. Thank you. Uh, when, I was in, when I was asked to think of a topic for this seminar on the pandemic, at first my Byzantine scholar's mind couldn't help going in a sort of Pavlovian response. 
to the plague of Justinian, the quintessential Byzantine pandemic. The plague of Justinian, um, we are in the sixth century, was the first worldwide plague pandemic in human history. This pestilence was named for the Roman Emperor Justinian the I, that ruled uh, from uh, 527 to 565. Um, who was ruling in Constantinople at the time of the pandemic. In spite of the name, the disease actually impacted not only the Byzantine Empire, but also the entire Mediterranean basin, Europe, and the Near East, including the Sasanian Empire. At its peak, the epidemic killed about a fifth of the population in the imperial capital and probably one-fourth of the whole European population, or more precisely, of the Eastern Mediterranean. Today, we know that this contagious disease was caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis, the same bacterium responsible for the more famous Black Death uh, of the 14th century, as archaeologists determined by examining DNA of human remains from grave sites dating to that period. DNA analysis also allowed scientists to track the origin of that pandemic to Central Asia. In fact, a skeleton found in Tianshan, a system of mountains ranges on the border of Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and China, dating to around 180 AD and identified as an early Hun, was found to contain the same strain of the Justinian plague strains, European samples. Historically, the Chinese have been pioneers in agriculture and intensive livestock farming. This is why China has traditionally been the most densely populated region on the planet. For this reason, the risk of a so-called zoonotic spillover, infection from animals to humans, is higher. Findings suggest that the expansion of nomadic peoples uh, who moved across the Eurasian steppe, such as the Sunnu, later the Huns, had a role in spreading the plague to West Eurasia from an origin in Central Asia. This explanation is actually dispelled by historical sources contemporary to the plague, which I'm going to show you soon. Uh, the sources clearly demonstrate that the plague came from the maritime trade routes, and more specifically, from the Red Sea and the African coast. The second major point at issue is the evolution of the plague, which we might interpret as a trail of recurrences from 541 to 750 AD, with the disease becoming more localized and less virulent. The plague weakened the Byzantine Empire at a critical point when Justinian's armies had nearly retaken all of Italy and the Western Mediterranean coast. The evolving conquest would have reunited the core of the Western Roman Empire with the, Est with the Eastern Roman Empire. In fact, in 533, Justinian secured the endless peace with the formidable Persian Empire in exchange for 11,000 gold pounds annually. So he could concentrate on the Western Front. By 540, the Byzantine military had made significant gains in North Africa and the Italian peninsula. However, the high mortality rate of the plague caused this several shortage of labor that had a tremendously negative effect. Uh, let's have a look at the sources. The most important information during this time comes from the Byzantine historian Procopius. At about this time, a plague occurred, as a result of which all human life was very nearly extinguished. Procopius detailed the early spread of the plague, stating, it began with the Egyptians living in Pelusium, a port in the eastern extremes of Egypt's Nile Delta, it divided and part went to Alexandria and the rest of Egypt and part of the people of Palestine, the neighbors of the Egyptians, and from there overran the whole earth. This disease always began from the coast and then moved up to the country inland. The outbreak in Constantinople was thought to have been carried to the city by infected rats on grain ships arriving from Egypt. In fact, to feed its citizens, the city of Constantinople and outlying communities imported, imported large amounts of grain, mostly from Egypt. 
The red and flea population in Egypt thrived on feeding from the large granaries maintained by the government. Procopius offers a detailed account of the terror of the plague and the death toll left in its wake, though sometimes the numbers seem inflated. The plague lasted in Byzantium for four months. Finally, the number of dead reached 5,000 a day and then attained 10,000 and even more than this. At that time, it was not easy to see anyone in Byzantium out of doors. All those who were in Elch sat at home, either tending to the sick or mourning the dead. If one did manage to see a man actually going out, he would be burying one of the dead. All work slackened, craftsmen abandoned of their crafts, and every task which any man had in hand. The account of Agathias, Agathias, I use the uh, usual pronunciation, a lawyer born in Asia Minor, Asia Minor, sometime around 532, provides corroborating testimony about the second wave of Justinian's plague that began in 551. From the 15th year of the reign of the Emperor Justinian, when the plague first spread to our part of the world, it had never really stopped, but had simply moved from one place to another, giving in this way something of a respite to those who had survived its ravages. It now returned to Constantinople almost as though it had been cheated on the first occasion into a needlessly hasty departure. Those who stood up to the disease longest barely lasted five days. People of all ages were struck down indiscriminately, but the heaviest toll was among the young and vigorous, and especially among the men. Two other first-time reports of the plague's ravages came from the Syriac church historians, John of Ephesus and Evagrius Scholasticus, a child in Antioch during that time. Evagrius was afflicted with the bubers associated with the disease, but survived. Over the course of his lifetime, the disease returned four times, ultimately taking the lives of his wife, a daughter and her child, other children, most of his servants, and people living at this country state. The dramatic loss of manpower is apparent from the historical accounts of Procopius and Agathias. The plague had a tremendous impact economically on the Byzantine Empire, for an empire that was still highly agrarian, and depending heavily on taxation, the immediate effects on the plague included loss of farmers and cash flow. The circumstances triggered the sequence of famines in the years to follow and had serious military consequences as well. For example, in, in 544, the Byzantine general Belisarius received orders for Italy to handle the impending siege of Rome led by the Gothic military leader Totila. Belisarius pleaded with Justinian for, inform, for reinforcements, but they did not come. Rome fell. Justinian would finally be able to fill the suitably sized army only after the plague subsided in 551. And by that time, he managed to reconquer only Ravenna and the Adriatic coast. If you want to know how the story ends, the territorial empire created by Justinian barely outlasted him, and his dreams of reconquest were near never fully realized. The loss of manpower caused by the plague impeded Justinian's reconquest efforts. A specific sector of medieval society ignored this terrible plague, focusing instead on an interior intimate and unsuspecting disease, the body. Ascetics aimed at defeating it. The Byzantines believed that the appearance of the outer body reflected the quality of the inner person's soul. As a result, bodily appearance became an important marker for gender, class, and moral worth. Within the religious community, sexuality represented the ungoverned worldliness of the body and abstention, the purity of the soul. The imperial body had to be perfect, and as a result, this figurement of the body of an, of an emperor or ambitious aristocrat could make him ineligible for public office. The physical body was believed to be inherently difficult to govern 
and could lead an individual into evil deeds. Therefore, it was necessary that the body be ruled by the mind, be disciplined. As a result, within the Byzantine secular tradition, the physical body was often punished, more or less symbolically. Christian holy men were troubled by uncontrollable urges. These same concerns were also attributed to holy women. The male authors of hagiographical texts describing female saints portray them as troubled by the conflict between mind and body, by a life in a female body that might long for sexual pleasure or because of its beauty lead men into sin. Let me introduce the example of Matrona of Perge, who lived uh, as a eunuch named Babylas in late 5th century Constantinople and founded a convent where nuns dressed as men. The male author of the life of Saint Matrona of Perge writes, she did not consider the body to be the most evil of foes after the manner of the hateful and loathsome Manichaeans but constrained its unreasonable urges with great wisdom, correcting it as is necessary in obedience to the blessed Paul, who says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the last thereof. The ecclesiastical rejection of the body contrasted with the attitude of the secular aristocracy with, uh, which celebrated the beauty of the human body and clothed it in luxury. This contrast is striking acting as a litmus paper that allows us to perceive the Byzantine culture, not as a one-dimensional, but rather as a diastratic and diatopic civilization, one that evolves in time and through social strata. Men who had adopted the ascetic life routinely starved their bodies into sexual submission. They were celebrated for the degree to which they could abstain from sustenance and uh, bear the discomfort of a life without warmth or freedom of movement. Saint Stephen the Younger restrained all his bodily urges through fasting and other forms of mortification. Saint Simeon fasted to overcome the snake in his belly, that is the sexual desire. Such a blending of secular and religious self-presentation is seen in the life of Saint Ionicius, which traces the saint's evolution from soldier to ascetic. During his life as a soldier, he performed their every military duty well, surpassing all in intellect and strength. And he appeared to everyone as a pleasant and most attractive man, not only because of the blossoming gracefulness of his youth and the splendor of his, of his handsomeness, but also because of his steadfastness and discipline and his praiseworthy demeanor and the great asceticism of his conduct. Later, after he became an ascetic, Saint Ionicius regularly drove the spirit of fornication out of women. He did so by taking the spirit into his own body and then doing battle with it. After one of these healing sessions, as he battled the spirit of fornication in his own body, he tried everything, fasting, vigils, sleeping on the ground, to force the demon to leave his body. Desperate, he offered his body to a large, to a large snake, hoping it would eat him and thereby destroy the demon. Female ascetics aspire to the same rigorous lifestyle as male ascetics. They ate little and carefully disciplined their bodies and never bathed. The most, the most graphic example of this is found in the life of Saint Mary of Egypt, one of many reformed prostitutes who became saints. In this particular account, she was found in the desert by a monk who initially assumed she was a demon. He describes her nakedness, her skin tanned almost to blackness and her short, sparse white hair. Initially, he did not suspect that she was a woman. He says that she is neither male nor female, but a creature. She has so deprived her body that she has lost her female nature entirely and purified her body, having worn out her flesh for the sake of Christ, our God. The same theme is recognized in the description of Saint Theoptiste of Lesbos. Those who saw her said, skin alone kept the bones in place, for there was hardly any flesh. 
In order to subjugate the body, Eastern Orthodox Christianity had developed a wide variety of theories and practices, and practices of meditation. One of the most prominent medieval writers was Simeon, the new theologian. Uh, we are in the 10th century. He expounded his visions and meditations in numerous hymns. At the core of his experience was the divine light. This practice became central to the monasticism that developed on Mount Athos, uh, a peninsula in what is now the northeastern part of Greece. It flourished in the period of the, of the decline of the Byzantine Empire and produced what we know called, what we now call hesychasm. This is a tradition of ceaseless prayer with complete silence of mind. Silence in Greek sounds is a here and the reunion of mind with heart. The meditation was accompanied by breathing exercises. The Azicast movement, which Gregory Palamas led in the 14th century, has its roots in Christian antiquity. Now, I have to admit that I have hoodwinked you. The slide of a Azicast ascetic wasn't Christian, but Buddhist. It represents the historical Buddha Shakyamuni and it is a marvelous statue exhibited at the Museums Insel in Berlin, dating to the Kushana period, probably in the case of this statue, we are in the second century AD. I use that image because scholars presume connections between breathing exercise among monastic communities along, the, along that highway of cultures that was the Silk Road. This frenzy of destroying the body contrasted sharply with the blossoming developments in Byzantine medicine, which on the contrary aimed at healing the body. The first hospital, hospitals were organized during the Byzantine period. Uh, this is, uh, these are the remains of the hospital, the Byzantine hospital in Sida, in present day Turkey. And this is a CGI um, representation of the so-called Hospital of Samson, 4th to 6th century AD. And the practice of Byzantine medical science and its social applications were regulated by a special medical legislation and deontology. During the Byzantine era, a network of philanthropic institutions offered a variety of services from sheltering travelers and homeless migrants to providing free medical care for the sick, nurturing orphans, and organizing food distribution during famines. The Emperor Nikephoros focus, concluding that the empire already had enough hospitals to meet its needs, felt obliged to issue a law banning the establishment of new ones. The contribution of Byzantine medical encyclopedists uh, from 370 AD to 650 AD to the chronicles of medical knowledge still awaits full scholarly assessment. We must acknowledge the achievements of Oribasius of Pergamus, Aetius of Amida, Alexander of Trales, and Paul of Aegina. For clarification, I have highlighted the geographical origin of each of them in this map. So we see Oribasius, Aetius, Alexander, and Paul. And I will um, copy and paste the link of this map from the, my Google Drive in the chat as soon as I'm over. In the shadow of Galen's legacy, second AD, one of the most accomplished of all medical researchers of antiquity. These writers preserved, organized, and explicated the diverse body of medical knowledge available to them, relying on Galen, but also medical writers from the sixth century BC onwards. Oribasius composed his compilations as a comprehensive source of medical authority. He studied the physiology of the kidneys and discerned the existence of the capillaries, trichoidis in his words, that is in the form of a lump of hair. 
some centuries before Malpighi, you also correctly described blood circulation generally in pulmonary as a precursor to the English William Harvey, 17th century, the first physician to describe completely the systemic circulation. Greek doctors were in high demand all over the, the known world, even in Persia and later in the Arabic Caliphate. Byzantine medicine was fruitfully connected with the Christian faith and developed the supreme model of the saints' unmercenary anarchy. Physicians such as Cosmas and Damian, third century, you might have seen this late masterpiece by the Spanish master of Los Valdases, flourished around 1495 and kept at the Welcome Library. Uh, Pantelemon, in English, he sounds uh, Pantelion, third, fourth centuries, and the women physicians and miracle worker saints, Zainais and Philonilla, first century, the, friend, the friends of peace, and Hermione, first century, sent the first, second centuries. In this way, our journey has come full circle from the plague through the asceticism to medicine and back. Let me then conclude our journey with two extraordinary images from Greek manuscripts to give you a first-hand glimpse of the depth and beauty of Byzantine scientific research the images and manuscripts I'm going to display demonstrate that humans have managed to extract beauty and hope from, from and in spite of pestilence. The Vienna Dioscurides is an early 6th century Byzantine Greek illuminated manuscript. The author of the text is the Danius Dioscurides, 1st century AD, a native of Anazarbus in Cilicia, present-day Turkey. He was a Greek physician, pharmacologist, botanist, and author of this five-volume Greek encyclopedia of herbal medicine. He was employed as a physician in the Roman army. This manuscript was created 1,500 years ago, around 515 AD in the Byzantine Empire's capital, Constantinople, for a resident Byzantine imperial princess, Anicia Juliana. Scholars now refer to the manuscript as the Juliana Anicia Codex. Although created as a luxury item, in later centuries it was used daily as a textbook in the Imperial Hospital of Constantinople, and the medieval note records that the Greek nurse there, named Nathanael, had it rebound in 1406. Throughout the Byzantine period, the manuscript was used as the original for copies of the work that were given to foreign leaders, including the Arabic edition of Abd al-Rahman III of Spain, which the Byzantine emperor Constantine VII sent a Greek copy and a translator to create. After the fall of Constantinople in 1453, a subsequent owner hand wrote each plant's name in Arabic and Hebrew. After remaining in Constantinople for just over a thousand years, the text passed to the Holy Roman Emperor in Vienna in the 1500s, a century after the city fell to the Ottomans. It is unbelievable how Greeks managed to apply their creativity, even under the stress of a breathtaking disease, and to fight in order to find a way out of it under the label of beauty. May this, may this be an example for all of us today. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Serge, for uh, a very rich uh, um, journey <laughs> through the different strata, historical strata uh, that you have uh, uh, outlined here. So I don't want to take uh, any more time. I think uh, um, we have already a few questions that are lining up in the uh, question and answer thread. 
and uh, um, so I would like to start with those. Uh, um, some of these have been answered, but not uh, everything. Um, before moving to um, other attendees, uh, uh, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question or add your answer in the thread as well. So the first question was um, uh, from Tej Greval to Diana. Uh, thank you for the great perspective and insight in indigenous survival and trauma through contact and pandemics. Uh, the question about Masui. I learned about Masui memorialization through statues as an indigenous figure who was of assistance to Europeans during contact. Uh, um, and however, to my knowledge, none of the statues that commemorate him mentioned that the survival story or how contact shaped his early life. And do you think that omitting his early life was intentional? and therefore an attempt to perpetuate indigenous stereotypes that you uh, mentioned. And Diana is uh, uh, replying that uh, because he formed an alliance with the early American colonists, he's valorized as someone who supported the establishment of the American state. He's celebrated for that only, likewise uh, Pocahontas. There is a little interest in his perspective or on the outcome of his community or family or even his son, Philip, who led the so-called King Philip's War, resulting in Philip's dismemberment and his head being put on a spike and displayed for two decades, presumably as a caution to indigenous rejection of American encroachment. So uh, the statue of Masui versus Masui's son's head on a spike. And Jana, in reply to Leslie uh, Turner, is also giving uh, some uh, uh, references that she can uh, recommend uh, that you can uh, obviously download from here. To argue for it, to protest for it. And this seems to me to not be about experts. It seems to me to be an expression of the will uh, of, of the people. And I think here, especially, we can see a shift from instead of experts scientists versus the people or telling the people what to do. It's an intergenerational clash, I think, between the young and the old. And I think this kind of clash, this clash of opinion between young opinion and old opinion is more appropriate for a democracy and the right grounds on which to have the discussion. With respect to the opioid crisis, I mean, we had the war on drugs. Uh, that didn't turn out very well. Um, I, in its favor, the language of war um, gives a sense of a collective experience or a collective responsibility. But I mean, the, the verdict is out. Uh, it, it, it has failed. Um, I'm worried especially about the, the opioid crisis because it's very easy to pathologize this, mm. to say that these are people are addicts, they have problems, and therefore in pathologizing just to push it away, to deflect. And so I wonder what could be the analog for the intergenerational clash in the situation of climate change to the opiate crisis. I would like to see it come off this um, pathologizing which, uh, or individualizing uh, that happens. Mm -hmm. But now I'll um, we'll go to Diana. Thanks, Andreas. And I have other questions later. But first, I, I would like to hear from Diana if you want to address this point about uh, the different uh, creative interpretation of the dead. I was, think, uh, I was just thinking about uh, Andreas's uh, um, discussion of the crowd of the dead and uh, Harold Cardinal is a, a Cree, uh, well, important political figure actually, but he talks about um, in one of his uh, last lectures about uh, the Cree search for knowledge and in, in the fact that it's actually no, uh, the model is rather than the one expert, it really is an intergenerational exercise that goes from one generation to the other that includes ancestors as well as descendants, not uh, some living, some dead, you know, like or some in this world, some passed on. And so just this idea of, uh, you know, rather than a, I mean, I love the, the, the poetry of the idea of the members of the living will always be with the dead that um, Andreas was talking about. But at the same time in this model of, of knowledge generation, it's that you, you have your obligations to, to actually draw on what's been known in the past and preserve for the future and, and that it's actually a, a more of a symbiosis. And so I was, I, I mean, there's just such a little scant note at the end of that, that archival document um, about, you know, the, that the boy 
had a dream about his grandfather visiting, you know, and, and I don't, th I mean, I, I'm going to interpret it, of course, without much more, but just the understanding of the world view, that it was a, a, a dream of, of hope, of, of, of helping him learn and get through, not of him trying to get, like, you know, cl claim him for the world of the dead, you know, and so I just, yeah, just thought I would uh, 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 mention that. Thanks. Yes, th thanks, uh, Diane. Uh, Andreas, did you want to rebut something or? Uh, no, no, no rebuttal at all. I think this, um, the, the fact that knowledge is indeed intergenerational, I think is, is much more helpful and more democratic, I think. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Diana. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I wanted to take the privilege of the moderator to ask a question actually of uh, uh, Sergio. Um, so you have uh, taken us uh, through this journey from a plague through asceticism to medicine. Uh, but I was wondering how each uh, stage and each uh, group of formation uh, would engage uh, or uh, what they would think of the others if uh, there is any evidence whatsoever at the level of manuscript or anything. I know that whenever we address antiquity, it's, uh, it's always uh, um, a, difficult, uh, um, a difficult question. So basically what would, for example, uh, um, the um, monks, the nuns, and the people who engage in asceticism, uh, 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 how would they speak of uh, plague outbreaks or altogether of the care of the body that uh, physicians were attempted to do? And on the other hand, how would physicians and any kind of health medical order, if we can use that expression, address this also almost contradictory position to their own practice, which is the spiritualization of the body or the engraving of the body, the flesh through the spiritual? Um, most Byzantine men, uh, underwent a sort of arc in their own lives. So they started soldiers and ended up uh, being uh, monks uh, by the end of their lives. So this conflict, this friction that you're uh, underpinning uh, was actually resolved in uh, each and everybody's life. Uh, a person might have a, a secular attitude till he was 40, 50, and then turn to the ascetic approach in order to atone uh, of uh, his sin. And then uh, maybe I would add, unfortunately, with uh, <laughs> a somewhat detrimental attitude, I'm sorry, but the majority of the sources we have from the Byzantine civilization and from uh, um, all the civilization before, I'd say, the 18th century and 19th century uh, are from male authors uh, for Byzantium, with the exception of Anna Komneni uh, in the 11th century. And the majority of the sources are from a highbrow uh, stratum. Uh, the majority, not, the, not all of them, uh, for example, we have access to what monks thought of diseases, plagues, and similar uh, issues in life, thanks to the margin notes in the liturgical prayer books. So it would be great. And pa some paleographists actually had thought about it, of um, writing a story of the fears and the nightmares of the Byzantine monks through their marginal notes, which would be fascinating actually, sort of Jungian access and time travel, <laughs> thanks to uh, Greek manuscripts. Um, so in spite of the mortification of the body as a choice of life, they are fearful nonetheless uh, of uh, getting uh, in uh, uh, the grip, so to say, of uh, epidemics of uh, any yeah. disease. Think, yes, yes. Actually, uh, broadly speaking, I think that um, out of fear, they created this shield of asceticism, asceticism to resist 
to the decayment, uh, to the decay of the body. Um, we must consider that uh, Byzantine sources, Byzantine, Byzantine writing was often inertial in style. So many of, much of the wording that Procopius, both Procopius and Agathias are using uh, is dipping into literally uh, Thucydides' um, description of the plague uh, in the fifth century before Christ in Athens, uh, the, the, the pestilence that killed Pericles. Uh, so um, there is a um, complaisance of mirroring uh, of the, from the side of the Byzantine intellectual uh, that is taking pleasure in, in quoting, mentioning, reusing ancient texts to describe uh, the present situation. So that's why we, uh, that's why historians and nowadays think that sometimes the numbers we have from the fifth, um, from the sixth century AD sources might be inflated because they mm. repeat the same virulence uh, with which the pestilence showed itself, presented itself uh, in the fifth BC. In previous times. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot to Sergio. And uh, we have also another question from Irini for Andreas. Uh, can you elaborate on the types of crowds and can we perhaps make a case uh, for their weaponization by populist leaders? I, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so Canetti's uh, crowds, uh, they are impossible to document. There's a lot. Um, there's upwards of 600, some people say, others uh, even more than that. So I, what Canetti does is he, he gives certain attributes to crowds. So for example, we have uh, a crowd that is uh, invisible. Or visible. So the crowd of the living is visible, the crowd of the dead is invisible. And at least in the, um, in the, uh, let me just say, Abrahamic tradition, the invisible dead, you know, are the ones that are buried, cremated, and so on, who will, you know, one day reappear, or will we find them in heaven, and, and, and so on. So they are, uh, they are invisible. Um, there are also open and closed crowds. So I use the example of Game of Thrones playfully. Um, an army, uh, a, a crowd in a stadium, a crowd in a um, uh, church. These are all closed crowds for Canetti, as opposed to an open crowd. Um, so, and, and these open crowds are, as, far, as best as I, I understand, the ones in which the burdens of distance are lifted. Because in an army, for example, you know you are inferior. In a church, you know, you know there's a hierarchy. So these are not, these are not the same for Canetti. Uh, the second thing that he does um, is to have these crowds work uh, in tandem as, as double crowds. So for Canetti, it's important that the living see themselves in relation to the dead and that we understand this. Uh, connection because it helps us see um, our own behaviors better. You can't just talk about the crowd of the living as we often do uh, today uh, in democracies and just you know leave it at that or forget the dead or grieve and that's it. And this is where it, it becomes a little more interesting with what I was trying to say about the experience of survival. One way of reading Canetti, those of you who know Thomas Hobbes, is you know, Tom, for Thomas Hobbes, uh, survival, the person who survives is a weak person, they're, they're about to die. So Canetti just flips this. Canetti says, no, and he's writing, uh, he's a Jew, he escapes, so he, he knows very well of the Holocaust. This is not as if he's blind to what happened in, in Europe. Um, he knows very well that the survivor carries this strength, this power. And so I think, uh, it's important, uh, it's important to recognize that as a, as a kind of threat uh, that can, in, insofar as uh, power can be abused uh, by the living um, over, over others. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's my answer. 
Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Andreas. Um, I have a question from James uh, to Sergio, who also has uh, his hand up. So um, when you reply to James, uh, Sergio, if you can also ask your question, but first uh, to James. Hey, Sergio, thanks for the presentation. It was great. <coughs> I had a question though. There's been, there was an article, I think it was last year or the year before. Honestly, time gets a little bit lost in the COVID verse. Uh, that went into how the textual representations of the plague of Justinian may have actually overblown its significance, and that other sources such as papyri, inscriptions, I forget there was a couple of other ones as well, basically argue that the plague was not as significant for the Byzantine Empire as it's generally represented. I was wondering if you've read the article or if you've seen similar articles and how do you feel about it, that kind of argument? I did, I totally agree with uh, the necessity of kind of downsizing uh, the digits uh, we usually attribute to the virulence of the pestilence. Um, but it's true as well that the majority of sources that we have uh, from papyri, for example, come from Egypt, yeah. Oxyrhynchus. Um, and Egypt, it's true, well, and that area was uh, less, paradoxically, it was less urbanized. What, what I mean is that uh, the papyri we have are a wonderful litmus paper of a very specific district, agrarian, not as urbanized as Alexandria or Constantinople uh, in a totally different area. So we know a lot from a, a different set of sources, but it actually on a different set of locations, right? So the virus, the virulence of a highly urbanized area like uh, Constantinople, the capital, and the Near East that was uh, with Antioch, for example, the Caesarea uh, with Beirut, uh, Beirut uh, was a Hammen, uh, a wonderful um, a plateau milieu of uh, subjects. I was on the fringe of saint citizens of subjects of the empire. Well, uh, it, I, I, th I think that it, the pestilence in those areas had to be, uh, had to have a, a higher impact than in the areas from where we can retrieve a pyrite. That's, that's why we have an imbalance in the sources. And as I mentioned, actually, yes, I do agree with you and with the authors of the articles of the, there is a strain, a trail of articles in the last decade, actually, about it. Um, uh, as I mentioned, our Byzantine authors are probably overestimating the impact of the pestilence because they, they can't help express, expressing themselves in, in the terms of ancient authors. It was a sort of Byzantine click. Uh, um, for example, uh, when uh, Rus, the, the, when the Rus enters the stage of history, uh, Byzantine authors called them the Scythians. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. and, and this inertia of naming people is over present all over uh, the Byzantine history. So that applies to a lot of facets of expressing oneself. So picking up some ways that this plague has to be at the same significance or scale as what we saw with the plague in Athens, for example, trying to pick up upon some of those tropes it seems in some ways. Yes, multiplied uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a on a world scale because as I, as, because as I hope I underpinned, it was the first pandemic actually, the first worldwide or at least the first uh, uh, the first known to us <laughs> pandemic uh, on a worldwide scale. So um, the pestilence in Athens was limited, actually, and more limited as a, exactly. as a scenery, right? So, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much, there, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you, James. Um, are there any other indigenous authors who have documented and collected uh, stories on the pandemics? Uh, and what about the Dion archive? Is it available online? What else does it contain? Um, are there other autobiographical references available? No, you're muted, uh, Diane. <laughs> of course, sorry. Um, no, my, the, there is, the Dion archive is not available online. It just, um, I happen to have gone 
uh, to the Glenbow and have it personally as part of my larger research project. I, I, I have to think a bit about other descriptions of pandemics because I was, to be honest, surprised when I came across this as I was preparing for the talk and have not seen a lot of, of descriptions of it. So it's quite unique. But I mean, uh, you know, off the top of my head, I haven't, I've only just heard the question. Uh, I mean, and there are, there's an incredibly large body of work by Indigenous authors that's been unpublished and um, languishing in archives all over, actually. Uh, you know, it, it probably the story of Indigenous uh, writing in North America, or certainly in Canada, I can speak very specifically, is about uh, um, either a, a lack of publishing opportunities or actually destructive editing practices. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly a, a, a much more than I'm probably aware of, but nothing comes to mind at this exact minute. Do you think that uh, there will come a time, perhaps, of uh, putting these uh, sources online? Is there some effort uh, to make uh, even research more available uh, uh, in archival uh, terms uh, to different investigators? I mean, it really, in some ways, it's, it's a bit of a thornier issue, not that, um, I mean, I think about uh, Edward Ahenikiu, Mike Mountainhorse, and, uh, uh, and De Joseph Dion, we're all writers who try desperately in their own lives. I have, you know, the archive includes letters to publishers. They tried very much during their own lives to be published. And so now, and um, then each of them were edited by someone after their death. And usually, uh, just usually not, not, not published in full anyway, let's say. And so, um, however, the, the family still has some kind of uh, a copyright over the unpublished material. And I think there's a real hesitation towards, uh, you know, just having material, there's this tension to not having materials just thrown up for free access for everyone. Uh, you know, when the family, you know, when the, the, the author himself had, had actually wanted to, to curate that material themselves. But on the other hand, there is also a, a real um, thrill. So I had the, the ability, the, um, opportunity to publish online the, you know gatherings was this anthology of indigenous writing that came out of uh, Thetis Press the Anakin Center in the 90s and so uh, we put it we were able to put a lot of things online through the people in the text and uh, but then use social media to contact a lot of authors that were have participated in these anthologies it might have been their only publication in their lifetime we wanted to follow indigenous ethics and get permissions but we also didn't, you know, it was, we just, we tried um, a, a hybrid approach, if you like, of, of right. getting the word out as much as we could, and actually to very warm response, you know, people who had lost their own copy, you know, and never thought they'd see their work again, or family members and that kind of thing. Right. So it is just a, it for, it for, you know, for this particular field, it's a bit, just a bit more complex, not impossible. So. Yeah, 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 of course, of course, of course. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. There is uh, one last uh, message. Oh, we have uh, one uh, last uh, here. Sarah, um, Lauren, could you open her mic? Hello? Yes, sir. Hi. Um, this was actually just in response to the last question as well. Um, I know that this isn't a comprehensive uh, book about pandemics in Canada that Indigenous people face, but uh, this this book called This Place, 150 Years Retold, does include uh, portions that have, um, that do talk about the uh, Indigenous experience of genocide, and there's, there's plenty of other uh, books by various authors. Um, there's one series of books. Uh, I only have one, The Pemmican Wars, I can't remember what the author is, somewhere at my bookshelf, but uh, I believe there's one, one of those books that does detail the pandemic, like, an, an experience of disease and pathologies that um, detail the Indigenous experience as well. That's, that's awesome. Did you say the Pelican Wars? It's the Pemmican Wars, is the one that I have, yeah. but yeah. it's just, I, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I will. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. 
It's, okay. a, it's a book of poetry by Marilyn Jamont, right? The Pemmican Wars? Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot there. No, there definitely, I don't mean to say that there isn't a lot of, of creative work done at, that, that um, refers to it, but I'm thinking about archival documents. I, I, it doesn't come to me, but you're right. There's certainly lots of um, discussions, both fiction and nonfiction. If you think about, uh, you know, even thinking about the St Stalin nation has put out in their textbook, a discussion of it, how it, it affected uh, um, their own memories of, 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 um, this, for example, but it's written from today's perspective. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot to, to Diane, <laughs> to all our panelists. Uh, we have uh, uh, reached uh, well beyond our time that we had uh, planned, but uh, since one speaker was missing, uh, we could uh, use uh, some more discussion time. Uh, I want to thank again the Department of Humanities, the Stavros Niakos Foundation of Hellenic Studies and the Institute for the Humanities for making this event possible. Uh, thanks for joining in this exciting uh, discussion and uh, we will be back in the new year with a new installment of uh, uh, Memory and Trauma through History and the Culture. Uh, and uh, uh, once again, thanks for your uh, um, insights uh, and, uh, uh, and also for, uh, uh, for the generosity of uh, putting uh, so, much, uh, so much effort uh, at uh, such a trying time uh, and considering also for those who are teaching at the time of the, of the term that we are finding ourselves in. Uh, so, uh, uh, thanks uh, again, everybody. Uh, hopefully see you next, uh, uh, next term, next year, and uh, stay, stay safe.